Welcome back to Harbour Unavailable. I mean, unboxed. Today, we're taking a look at our first Radeon RX 6800 graphics card. And yeah, I know these things are virtually impossible to buy right now, and really they are impossible to buy at a reasonable price. So yeah, we totally agree that that sucks. Extremely frustrating, but sadly, there's nothing I can really do about it. But rather than just sit on these graphics cards, leave them laying around my office or whatever, and hold back our review until stock levels improve, I think it really does make sense to get this content out ahead of time, so once they are available, you'll know exactly what to buy. I have seen a few arguments against reviewing products such as this one while the stock levels are terrible. Arguments such as we shouldn't give these companies free advertising and instead withhold the reviews to punish them for the poor availability. Frankly, to me, that just doesn't make sense. If we review now or later, the company in question is still getting exposure and really by withholding third-party objective reviews, well, that just serves to punish you guys. People who are trying to find out if, say, this product is any good or not, should they buy it, are there any things they need to know about, that's what we're here for. So, yeah, it's hardly hurting the company, especially when they're moving anything and everything that they can produce within seconds of it going on sale. As for the free advertising bit, I can proudly say by this point that we've proven when sending a product to Harbour Unboxed, it's by no means guaranteed positive exposure for the company. Over the past few years, we've killed more bad products than I care to remember, and a few of them were graphics cards. So for those of you who were simply going to dislike or be offended by this content, I hope that does help explain our position on this a little bit better. And with that, let's take a look at what is meant to be one of the more affordable custom Radeon RX 6800 graphics cards. The PowerColor RX 6800 fighter caught my attention when it briefly went on sale in the US for about $20 US below the MSRP over at Newegg.com. Of course, that was short-lived, and sadly, like most graphics cards at the moment, it is currently unavailable everywhere I looked in the US. That said, fellow Aussies can buy this model at the time of making this video. It's selling for $1,049 AUD over at PC Case Gear, which is about $100 AUD over the base MSRP. So, not a terrible price, but certainly not great either, and it is worth noting that PC Case Gear also has RTX 3070s in stock for just shy of $1,000 AUD. Of course, this stuff does move fast, so by the time I get this content online, it's hard to say what will be available, if anything. Anyway, the RX 6800 fighter is meant to be a more affordable model, so the question is, should you buy it when you can? So, to answer that question, let's start by looking around the card, then we'll tear it down for a close look, and then of course we'll go over some graphs. Has to be said, the Fighter is a pretty simple looking graphics card. Nothing too flashy here, and in fact there are no flashy lights to speak of, so a bit of a no-frills affair then. In total, the card measures 300mm long, 120mm tall, and is 50mm wide, so it will take up three slots. Therefore, while a simple enough looking card, it is suitably high-end, tipping the scales at 1109 grams, and with three 90mm fans, it should perform quite well. On the front side of the card, you'll find a black plastic fan shroud, which, as I just mentioned, houses a trio of fans. Then on what is traditionally the outer facing edge, you'll find the power color and Radeon branding in silver, along with two 8-pin PCIe power connectors. Then around on the back side of the card, you'll find a gloss black aluminium backplate, featuring a few cutouts at the end that allow air to pass through. Again, it looks quite simple, but that's not to say it won't work well. And wrapping up our external look at the card, we find ourselves at the I.O. panel, and here there is a single HDMI 2.1 port, along with three DisplayPort 1.4 outputs, and then a small circular red button which allows you to switch from the default BIOS to an OC BIOS. And with the OC BIOS active, the circular red button lights up, though it is very faint and difficult to see that it does light up, but it does. And for those of you wondering, by default the card operates at a max boost frequency of 2105 MHz, and then with the OC BIOS enabled, that boosts the frequency to 2155 MHz. So, a rather pointless 2.4% overclock. Anyway, that's the external look at the fighter. Again, a very basic looking graphics card, but so far it looks very good in terms of design and build quality. Now, it's time to take this thing apart, and we'll start by looking at the cooler. PowerColor is cooling the GPU, GDDR6, and VRM components, all with a single heatsink, meaning there are no additional heatsinks or heat spreaders on the card. So again, keeping things very simple. 
The cooler is made up of two main banks of aluminium fins. There are five copper heat pipes in total and a large copper base making contact with the GPU. And none of this copper features any fancy nickel plating, for example. Then making contact with the memory and power delivery components, PowerColor has used aluminium plates as this is the most cost-effective method of cooling that hardware. In total, the cooler weighs 749 grams and that includes the fans and fan shroud. So a reasonably heavy cooler. But anyway, we'll move away from the main cooler and we'll check out the back plate, which weighs just 98 grams. And presumably to save money, PowerColor hasn't used any thermal pads on the rear side of the PCB, which would see the back plate used more as a heat spreader. So the back plate is just that, it's a back plate. I guess it can protect the rear side of the PCB, though it's probably not great at reducing flex given that it is very thin and lightweight. Then over on the 250mm long PCB, we find a pretty basic VRM configuration, 11 power stages for the GPU and 2 for the GDDR6 memory. In comparison, the AMD reference card uses a 12 plus 3 configuration, so PowerColor has cut that down to an 11 plus 2 configuration, though to be fair, the reference card is very robust, so this should work just fine. Now, in terms of clock specifications, PowerColor lists a standard boost clock frequency of 2105 MHz, which is the default spec set by AMD. The GDDR6 memory also operates at the 16 gigabits per second spec, which is normal for all RX 6800 graphics cards. As mentioned earlier, the card does include an OC bus, but it only increases the boost frequency by a mere 50 MHz, an increase that's likely to only net you an additional 1 to 2 FPS. Now, playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider for 30 minutes saw the fighter peak at 69 degrees in a 21 degree room inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D, fully populated with fans. And that's 4 degrees cooler than the AMD reference card, which is impressive given that both consumed a similar level of power, but the fighter was much quieter at 31 decibels versus 35 decibels for the AMD reference model, though I should note that the AMD reference model is only a 2 slot card, whereas the fighter is a 3 slot card. So Bit of an advantage there in terms of size for power colors, more affordable RX 6800 graphics card. Now, speaking of fan speed, in order to maintain at this temperature, the fan spun at just 1300 RPM, which really is a very low fan speed. The typical core clock speed seen during our testing was 2205 megahertz, and that saw the power consumption for the graphics card hit 241 watts, so a few watts less than the AMD reference model. Now, for overclocking, with the limits reached, we saw a peak operating temperature of 71 degrees, but this time the fans spun ever so slightly faster at 1350 RPM. And again, they were very quiet here and won't be heard over most case fans. Now, this overclock saw the cores operate at 2340 megahertz on average, and the memory hit 17.1 gigabits per second, which is the current limit enforced by AMD. Finally, when overclocked, the card sucked down 258 watts, so a 7% increase from the stock factory OC configuration. Okay, so let's move into the benchmark graphs. As usual, we're testing with our AMD Ryzen 9 3950X GPU test rig with 32GB of DDR4 3200CL14 memory. And please note the latest drivers available at the time of testing have been used. Okay, let's jump into the results. As usual with these custom AIB card reviews, we're not going to look at loads of gaming benchmarks. In fact, Shadow of the Tomb Raider will do it. That said, if you want loads of benchmarks, then feel free to watch my day one review where I tested 18 games against a whole heap of different graphics cards, or you can check out my 41 game benchmark between the RX 6800 and RTX 3070. But yeah, as I said, for this one, just one game as the focus really is on thermals, power and overclocking. So as expected, out of the box, the 6800 fighter is on par with the AMD reference card, both delivering 133 FPS on average at 1440p. Then with my manual overclock, I was able to boost performance by a further 5%, about what I was able to achieve with the AMD reference card, so not particularly impressive. That said, it did help make up some of the difference to the stock 6800 XT, but of course you can also overclock that part. Now, in terms of power usage, the PowerColor Fighter is very efficient using a few watts less than the AMD reference model. As mentioned earlier, my overclock increased the power usage by 7%, which isn't bad given we saw 5% more performance in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Now, here's a look at the stock out-of-the-box operating temperatures. Again, as seen earlier, the fighter peaked at 69 degrees, 
which is four degrees cooler than the AMD reference card. Then for further comparison, we have a few 6800 XT models that I've already reviewed, and given they consume more power, it is of little surprise that they ran a little bit hotter. So the GPU die temperature is good, as is the GDDR6 memory temperature, though the VRM temp is a little high at 80 degrees. Certainly nothing to worry about, but given the GPU and memory temperatures, I had expected the VRM to be around 10 degrees cooler. That said, the fighter is at a bit of a disadvantage in this test, as the card runs extremely quiet by default, so let's move on to the noise normalized testing. With the operating volume normalized, the fighter looks very impressive relative to the AMD reference model. We're looking at a 15 degree reduction in operating temperature for the GPU, which is massive, and about a 10 degree reduction when compared to high quality air cooled 6800 XTs such as the Red Devil. The GDDR6 memory also ran very cool in this test, peaking at just 55 degrees, which is a 9 degree reduction when compared to the AMD reference model. Then finally, we see a huge improvement in VRM operating temperature with the higher fan speed, which naturally increases airflow. When compared to the out-of-the-box configuration, we're looking at a 17 degree drop, and this saw the fighter match the AMD reference model. So, is the PowerColor RX 6800 fighter any good? Quite simply, yeah, it is. It's a very high quality graphics card with no real issues to speak of. Uh, it is certainly very basic in terms of appearance and design, but as I said, with solid build quality and excellent thermal performance, what more do you need? It has all the essentials. You know, you've got the dual BIOS switch, so that's very handy. Do like to see dual BIOS, especially on cards that do cost this much. Uh, as for the RGB lighting, certainly not an essential in my book, so I'm quite happy to see all the flashy stuff gone. And aesthetically, I think the card does look quite nice. It doesn't have any crazy accents or highlights or anything like that, which makes them a bit flashier, but again, that is perfectly fine with me, a bit of a stealthy looking graphics card. And I think that probably is the best way to summarize this. It is a very serious looking graphics card, and it sort of trims off all the fat. In fact, the only problem with this product right now is of course availability, but that's a problem that affects basically all graphics cards right now. But as I said earlier, the point of this review was to let you know if the FIDO was worth buying, and thankfully it doesn't suffer from any major flaws, or really any flaws at all to speak of, unless the very basic looking design is somehow a deal breaker for you. Having said all of that, this is an MSRP product, or at least should be priced at or very near to the AMD base MSRP, so $580 US. Right now over at PC Case Gear, it's $1,049 Australian, but for just $20 more you can grab the Red Dragon model, or at least you could if it was in stock. And worse still for the fighter, the Red Devil version is just 5% more expensive here in Australia, though again it's also out of stock. Therefore, I assume the reason why PC Case Gear still had the fighter in stock, at least at the time of making this video, was because most shoppers are holding out for these slightly more expensive Red Dragon and Red Devil models. So in Australia, the fighter would need to cost about $950, and that would make the Red Devil about 15% more expensive, which is typically what we've seen in the past, take the 5700 series for example. Anyway, at the right price, the PowerColor RX 6800 Fighter is an excellent graphics card. So fingers crossed, availability improves soon, allowing you to snag one at or very near the MSRP. And that is going to do it for this video. So if you liked it, feel free to hit the like button. We do appreciate that. You can subscribe for more content. I do have a whole lot of, actually I shouldn't have said that. I do have some an unspecified number of hard to purchase graphics cards that hopefully will be in stock soon. Uh, RTX graphics cards, Radeon graphics cards. So we got some, some GeForce RTX 3080s and 3090s. I've got some more 6800s and 6800 XTs that I wanna look at, but I'm not gonna flood the channel with that content now because I know it is very frustrating, you know, wanting to get your hands on one of these to play all your favorite games. And yeah, it's just not a great situation. Tim did a video summarizing the situation uh, a lot of you guys enjoyed the empty table of B-roll because, well, that was really the best GPU of 2020. But anyway, as I said, there's not much we can do about it. We're also frustrated because there's lots and lots and lots of content that I would like to be making and it'd be much more enjoyable making this content without having to give the out of stock disclaimers and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, like the video, like. You can also uh, join the Harbour Unbox community over on Floatplane or Patreon. So check out which one of those services 
you prefer. If you do want to support the channel and get some pretty cool perks in return, we have a monthly live stream, which comes up towards the end of the month. Tim and myself get together and do that. Q&A series, a behind the scenes content for Harbour and Box community members, as well as a private Discord server. So anyway, as I said, if you're interested, the links for those things are in the video description. Other than that, just thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.